Okay, well, thanks everybody for settling down. We've got a great panel here on uh, border and border security, and I'm very excited because we've got people actually from the border to talk about it. Um, you know, often uh, us in the press, we live in Austin for the most part, who capital, who 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 cover the capital, um, and so it's really great uh, to talk to people actually on the border to hear about the reality down there and what's going on with them. Uh, to my immediate left, we have Representative Oscar Longoria uh, from Mission. Uh, Next to him is Judge Dale Carruthers, who is a Terrell County judge out in West Texas. Um, and she can really drive a pickup truck, I'll tell you. And we'll, we'll get more into that. Um, and next to her, we have uh, Mayor Javier Villalobos of McAllen. Um, he is a Republican, not that that matters in a mayor position. Uh, but he, uh, he made a big uh, splash, I guess, by winning the mayoral seat uh, down there in McAllen. Uh, as a Republican. And next to him, we have Representative Eddie Morales of Eagle Pass, um, also very knowledgeable about the border. Um, and here we go. I mean, we're just going to get started, just jump right in. Um, obviously, with border issues, the first thing we talk about um, legislature wise is Operation Lone Star. Um, at this point, we've spent $4 billion plus. I'm not really sure where some of that money comes from, but maybe, maybe we'll figure it out. Maybe Representative Longoria can help us out here. Um, but I guess I just want to start off with, there's so much debate um, in Austin about, you know, is there really a crisis on the border? Um, are we spending our, our state money wisely? Um, and, you know, we've got um, two Democrats up here two Republicans, one Republican who used to be a Democrat, and we'll talk about that a little bit as well. Um, but I just want to hear from y'all's perspective, like, do we even need Operation Lone Star? What is the reality in your neck of the woods, and do you think we need it? Well, you know, I think that's a tough question, right, because there's pros and there's cons to the operation. Um, you know, I've been privy to the process, legislative process, going on my sixth term, right? I've seen the way things have kind of changed, you know, from 2013, kind of all the issues on the border till now. I mean, there was a point in time where there was high-speed chases all of 281, which is one of our, our bigger roads. Um, and maybe the mayor can, can kind of get into this right now. But things have kind of subsided, right? Now, do we have folks crossing the border? Yes. Are many of those individuals coming out here to Texas or trying to get somewhere else in the United States because they're trying to flee bad conditions? Yes. But at the same time, there is folks that are coming across, you know, wanting to transport narcotics, taking advantage of those individuals, or maybe trying to flee some circumstances because maybe they, they may be involved in some type of illegal activity. But I think for the most part, the individuals that are trying to cross are trying to better themselves and their families, right? So the issue arises for us in the border is where I, I feel I'm, I'm safe, right? I feel I live in the city of Mission. I feel it's a very safe city. I have two little girls, um, born and raised in South Texas, went back when I graduated from the University of Texas. So I feel the community is safe. Now, alongside that river, which is that separation between us and Mexico, there's always been trafficking. And things have changed. Trafficking has changed. Now, I think as legislators, and my role is, where does the state of Texas fit into all of that? And the reason I echo that is, you know, there was a time where, unfortunately, the federal government wasn't providing the resources to the federal agencies, in my opinion. And what I mean by resources is cameras, you know, surveillance, you know, all that technology. So the Department of Public Safety, through various initiatives, and it changes all the time, you know, there was at one point where we funded various planes, aerostats, and these planes fly across the border at night, kind of look for individuals and especially during the day. Now, during the day, it's incredibly hard because it's so hot in South Texas that you just see these heat pockets. Many times it could just be brush. Many times it could be folks trying to cross, right? So it's a very difficult job. It's very technology, resource-based, and all that costs money. Uh, federal government, their stuff flows a little bit differently. So what I would see the positives is our funding would help curtail some of that illegal activity because the federal government wasn't providing for that. Now, the question arises for us is we need to make a financial decision as a state. When do we stop? How do we stop? Do we scale back? And frankly, I think the initiative in the border will never change. Security initiative, Operation Lone Star, whatever operation you want to call it, it's just a question on do you scale back? Do you rev it up? And where can you help local authorities? Now, I've always been a proponent where if the funding's going to come down, it's coming down to South Texas. I told my local sheriff, I told my local municipalities, focus on your city. 
you don't need to be focusing on helping so much on the border because these operations are there to cur- curtail that illegal activity and then hopefully you know work hand in hand with border patrol but it's just so complex because you have a state that's on the border you have a federal issue but sometimes it does become a state issue so it's very difficult to kind of give you know a one one answer i mean it's just a complex issue that i've seen you know over the last 12 years judge carruthers yes um here in Terrell County, I have one of the largest land masses in Texas. I'm probably the fifth largest county in Texas with uh, one of the smallest populations. So in saying Operation Lone Star, is it, it's imperative to my county. I have less than 1,000 people, and we have the, the least to offer and the most to lose because I have 91 miles of border. And securing the border uh, and what we see, just as diverse as each one of us here and the regions we represent, um, the people that come across that border are as different as that is, too. In my region, we see a lot of men dressed in camo. I'm in the brush. It's it's the desert. So you're going to see a lot of really, really rugged terrain, people crossing it. And uh, they're not coming as asylum seekers. They're, they're smuggling drugs and they're running and we get a lot of high-speed pursuits in my region. And um, saying that, um, I butt up against Valverde County, Brewster County and Pecos County. So literally in the middle of nowhere and without Operation Lone Star, I feel that our 91 miles of border could be potentially compromised. Uh, we greatly appreciate all that help, and uh, I communicate with every every level of uh, of the county government, state, and every level to try to make sure that Terrell County is is taken care of. But it is very very crucial to my particular region. And right now, uh, we are the beginning of the Big Bend Mountain uh, region. So right now, we are the hot spot. And uh, on any given day, you know, you can have uh, anywhere from 17 pursuits uh, happening before one o'clock, right after like now. You can seriously have that many pursuits happening and it's a lot of coverage and and we can't do it alone with a population of less than a thousand people. So it's very crucial. Mayor Villalobos. Yes, certainly. Well, first of all, we start off with the premise that we shouldn't be involved in, in immigration at all neither municipalities or state, but we do it for public safety. So we get into the issues of, first of all, and also we're no longer the hotspot like we were a, co- a couple of years ago. It has shifted from uh, the Rio Grande Valley towards Laredo, towards Eagle Pass, Del Rio, and now here we go. So it's totally different for, for us. For us now, what we have is pretty much asylum seekers, which we've been dealing with for quite a bit. So you get into the issue of Lone Star, Operation Lone Star, and even though we still have some issues where people just trying to go in, we don't deal with that. Because that's pretty much kind of like Representative Longoria says, mission is safe. Well, McAllen was the sixth safest city in the country. Last year, we were the seventh safest city in the country. This year, the sixth safest city in the country. Second best as far as violent crimes in the state of Texas. So, and sometimes I think, do we attribute part of that to Operation Lone Star? And I think we do. I think we do part of it. And then the other thing is the economics. So there's different different views. For us, in the Rio Grande Valley, especially in McAllen, the tremendous economic impact of Operation Lone Star. You know, we hardly ever see the National Guard. DPS, we really don't see them very often because they're out there. But every day, every night, the spending, all the hotel rooms full, the restaurants, the everything. So for us, it's pretty much been a boon. Uh, our, we have a very safe area. So, I mean, I, I just can't. I mean, I see for us, Operation Lone Star has been a success. Representative Morales. Yeah, as the only Democratic joint author of HB9, which appropriated an additional $1.8 billion for border security, I have seen the benefits that Operation Lone Star has brought to the border. So uh, this is a a mixed answer that I'm going to give you because one year down now, we can safely say we've, we've tossed at this issue over $2 $2 billion from what were appropriated on HB9, and you mentioned in totality over $4 billion. 
And we can't keep doing the same thing and expecting different results. You need to listen to folks that are on the border, that lived on the border, and that know how the border works if we want to fix this. Is there a solution? There is a solution, and I'd like to focus on that now. I sent the letter uh, to the governor back in May, and we've had follow-up conversations and interviews, and I really do think that we need to think outside the box when it comes to border and immigration, that Texas can lead on this issue, and we can show other states how we can take control of our border and make it to where it's a win-win situation. One of the things that I think that we need to focus on is if these migrants are crossing the river right now, we're doing it wrong. And what I mean by that is we are incentivizing human smugglers and cartels from charging these individuals to continue crossing through the river and exposing our National Guard and our troopers as well as our uh, Border Patrol. My brother-in-law is a Border Patrol agent. I have a lot of friends that are Border Patrol agents and law enforcement. Of course, I don't want anything to happen to them. We've lost already humans, both migrants and law enforcement individuals to this operation. And a year down the road, we keep having these huge numbers. Has it been worthwhile? Yes, because when I needed that help in Del Rio, I called in less than 24 hours. Director McCraw had over 100 troopers there to help with the migrant search that took place earlier in the year where we saw from 1,000 multiplied to over 15,000 in less than 50 in less than 24 hours. When Judge Carruthers called and said, now everything is being pushed up here through Terrell County, we don't have enough troopers. One call is all that it took, and within 24 hours, she had additional troopers to assist her one sheriff that is out there. And so, to me, I think it's a, it's a mixed issue of, yes, there has been successes, but we can't continue to throw this money. How do we fix it? You know, I've gone and done, done interviews, and some of you may, may have listened to this, but if you haven't, I think, you know, when the Mexican mayor, um, and I visited with him, they did an audit of all these migrants coming in. They put them in an old maquiladora that they retrofitted with restrooms and all of that so that they could be housed in there. They did an audit of every one of the migrants, and everyone had close to two to $5,000 in their pockets because that's how much they know that what, what's going to cost to get smuggled into the U.S. What if Texas charged an asylum application fee of $2,000, let's say, for every one of those migrants that was gonna, they're already gonna make it. They are given papers immediately after they cross. The troopers, the border patrol, no one can stop them or ask them to go back. They just process them. But if we charge, the state charged 2,000, we had only in the Del Rio sector, which is Eagle Pass, Del Rio, and Terrell County, those areas, we had 1,600 crossings daily. That's $3.2 million daily that we could make. That's over $1.2 billion that the state of Texas can make on asylum application fees. And then we put conditions on them. They're already, most of them are gonna be model citizens, James, and you know this, over 90, 95% or more. They just want a better life. I can ask every one of you in this room, and you would probably wanna do the same thing, and you would not wait five or 10 years for somebody to tell you you could cross, that your paperwork wasn't processed when your kids weren't getting fed and getting nourished the way that they should be. You would take it upon you to give them a better life, and this is what these individuals, most of them are doing. And in doing so, we need to understand that, do workforce agreements, do like an EIN pilot project, which is what I mentioned to the governor also, they get a purple ID card. They're able to now live here in Texas, but with the condition that they have to work. We need to make sure that the message in Mexico and in Latin America and in all these other places where they're coming, that the message is clear. If you come to Texas, we're gonna ask you to work. You're gonna pay into the system, not pull out of the system. After a five or seven year period, we're charging renewal fees also uh, and make sh making sure that they're in good standing. Even that purple EIN pilot project could have like a RFD, uh, RDIF chip to where any law enforcement individual could just, you know, charge them with a gun and you can tell who that individual is and we can keep somewhat of a control as to where, where these migrants are. But we make them come out of the shadows, we make them be part of society, and there's also this condition that they can't get anything over a Class C misdemeanor. They're positive contributors to our economy, which we need. Our unemployment is super low, here in, the tex in Texas, and at last count, we had over 850,000 jobs that remain unfilled. Do we need this work? Yeah, it's work that nobody else wants to do. They're willing to do it because they want a better life for their family. And I think that those are the focuses that we should make, workforce agreements, pilot project on the EIN, and making sure that we create 
somewhat of a pathway by which these individuals can come out of the shadows. I'm not talking about citizenship or anything like that, but I'm just talking about a format by way by which we can have some maintenance. There's some renewal fees that are paid into it. And so the state is actually making money on this issue rather than the money that is being wasted at the federal level and at the state level. Congress has failed to act in over 40 years. This is a total failure on Congress's part. So we're having to now lead on this issue because Congress has failed us. And that's what we need to understand. And we need to also make sure that we send up Congress, both House of Representatives and U.S. Senators, that we make them, are you going to fix this or are you going to allow it to continue for just for purposes of being able to uh, drumbeat your base whenever you need them in the next race? And, and, and in the process, this should not be an R thing, this should not be a D thing, this should not be an independent thing, it should just be about fixing this issue regardless of where we stand as a party or a party affiliation. Thank you. Mayor Vito. And I think you hit it right there, Congress, the Senate, and the President, because at the very end, it is not a municipal or a state issue. I've, had, I've probably done hundreds of interviews and discussed the issues about immigration, everybody talking about comprehensive immigration. Well, that's... I'll say it, it's BS, because nobody wants to do it. Washington is so divided, so polarized, that they, they won't do it. They discuss about DACA, for example, that I guess either side is okay about, hey, let's, there's a lot of good people there, let's fix it, but they don't. We talk about, we know that the population of the United States is aging. We know that the birth rates are lower, and we know we need people to work, which means allow some people to come in. Asylum seekers that are capable and able to work, but they won't do it. And I th always suggested piecemeal it. You can do one part, another part, but it's Washington at the very end. It is Washington that fails to do what they're supposed to do. And they use, and I'll say it again, and I wrote for feathers all the time, they utilize these type of social issues to divide people, to conquer, and to raise money. It happens, it happens throughout with immigration, it happens with the social issues of immigration, uh, with uh, abortion, with gay rights, everything. They split people, they raise money, and we gotta stay away from that. We gotta come back towards the middle and do what's best for the American people. And the, what's best for the American people is really fix up the issue, especially immigration right now. We gotta do it. But it is not you, it is not uh, Representative Longoria, it is Washington. Well, let me, let me just uh, jump in here because I, I sort of love the nuance that you guys are talking about and the different perspectives on Operation Lone Star, but Representative Morales um, you know, presents, uh, I think, an interesting proposal here in terms of um, why wouldn't we have a workforce agreement where we could have these people coming and we could vet them. Judge Carruthers, we were just talking about these people are coming in and, and, and it's the gotaways. We don't know who the bad guys are, right? Um, but a vetting process would say like, okay, you are an upstanding citizen, you can come here, and you're talking about, it sounds like, something that's not even a path to citizenship, but it's a path to, uh, it's just a temporary permit, um, or whatever the case may be. Um, these are things that not only you are offering, I know Representative Raymond has offered, um, Beto O'Rourke offered it during his, uh, during his campaign, um, and, and the state of Texas could do this, right? I mean, the state of Texas could implement a workforce agreement. It sounds like Democrats would be for it, but we've got two Republicans here. It sounds like Mayor Villalobos, you would be interested in well, that. I definitely Judge would. The, I only, the only issue I see, though, is I, I think that's more a federal issue. I don't know whether the state of Texas would be able to do that. Because at the very end, it is a federal issue whether you can work or not. And that's where we run into some, some problems. And I mentioned that in the letter to the governor, that some of this may draw the ire of the Department of Justice at the federal level, but then again, the argument would be that Congress has failed us for 30 or 40 yeah, years. When, when has Texas been scared to draw the, draw the ire of the <laughs> federal <True>. government? <laughs> and, and, and that we've had to defend our, our border and, and defend ourselves. You know, and we can't continue doing this. You know, I call it Operation Lone Star has had its success. But I see it now as a three, four million dollar stopgap that doesn't address the real issue. Are we at that point, are we going to continue throwing money and just claiming that it's a success because we have all these arrests? Or are we going to fix the central issue, fix the actual issue itself so that we don't keep throwing money at it year after year after year? I'd much rather that money go into public education. I'd much rather go into property tax relief. I'd much rather see it in a number of mental health awareness uh, initiatives that everyone in Texas needs and that we're sorely lacking also, rather than keep throwing it on the, on the border.
I, I want to go to Judge Carruthers um, just because we are talking about um, the the federal government and its role in here. And Representative Longoria, you kind of talked about this as well. When they don't when they don't do the things that they're supposed to, it makes the state sort of have to fill in those gaps. Um, but Judge Carruthers, I, I sort of alluded to this earlier, but you'd been a longtime Democrat out there in Terrell County. Um, your whole family was Democrat, um, and. Uh, I think recently in the last year or so, you have become a Republican, um, partially, and I think in large part because of the border crisis in your neck of the woods. I wonder if you can sort of talk us through that and sort of your appeals. I think there were some appeals to the federal government from your behalf, and it, you didn't hear back from them, but, but you heard from the state. Right. Um, I feel that um, myself, watching how the Biden administration failed uh, the United States on the border situation would make anybody second guess, you know, what your standards are. And and myself, and, and I'm speaking for all the ranchers on the border as well, because we're a fourth generation rancher. We have uh, 17,000 acres on the border of Mexico. And let me tell you something, when they said the borders are opened and, and yes, failure to secure the border, the federal, this isn't Texas's job. We were here on that ranch when Texas became Texas, but we're having to deal with it. We are do doing what the federal government isn't doing and hasn't been doing since uh, the Biden administration took office. But regardless of whether we're Republicans or Democrats, we are Texans. And it, yes, I agree that I wish that we didn't have to face what the federal government's shortcomings have brought us to, but we're here. Tech and Operation Lone Star is super critical right now because we have got to secure this border. Uh, immigration reform is imperative. I believe that every level of immigration reform needs to be looked at. I mean, I'm dealing with it every single day. And I'm going to tell you something. Having that ranch for four generations, we've always dealt with people coming from Mexico. But when 120 countries come through Terrell County, there's an issue. You know, when they think that they have the right to destroy our, our uh, land, our fences, cut them, destroy our water. I mean, water is expensive. And, and out on the ranch, it's a game reserve. The food that you put on your table, somebody has to raise it. Somebody has to bring it to you. And those people are being compromised by others that think that they're entitled. So it, every bit of it's wrong. Uh, immigration reform, I do agree with, I, I mean, on different levels. It's going to have to be so multi-layered that everybody's voice needs to be heard because if we don't do something, um, be prepared to be a doormat. But I'll tell you one thing, Terrell County does not want to be a doormat. Yes, I do have 91 miles of border. That's why I'm sitting here right now telling you exactly what we, what we feel should happen. And you know how big it is. I took you all over the it's county. It's a big old ranch. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I, she said, uh, this ranch is like my backyard. I said, okay, I'll be there at noon or something. And she said, it's going to take the whole day. And it yeah. did take the whole day. So, And just for, uh, for context, Harrell County, um, the sheriff uh, is, is the main law enforcement that you have there. I think they ha he has like four deputies. It's, it's not a big department. No, it's not that big, uh, yeah. For, and, and, mm -hmm. and you were telling me uh, before, before we came up here that you have sometimes 60 people, 49 people coming through your ranch in one day. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Not too long ago, I was just going to uh, mention this to you guys. Not too long ago, I was in Washington listening to the families of the Voices of Fentanyl. And fentanyl is being tra uh, trafficked through the county all the time. It, drugs are being trafficked through the county. And on the day that I was there, of course, people were being bussed all over the country in groups of 50, which is fine. We can't keep them in Texas. They've got to go somewhere. If you don't feel the weight of the, of the burden, you don't believe it exists. But on that particular day um, that I was, a few days before I had left, they apprehended a group of 49 which would be, you know, it's right behind our house, but it's like four or five house distance if you're going to try to measure it in your own neighborhood. And um, then one day we apprehended 60. This is still on the ranch, groups of 60 or groups of 49 or 30. I mean, you know, I support anybody that tries to protect their own neighborhood. You know, Neighborhood Watch is an amazing thing. It's always worked in the cities, but Neighborhood Watch in the country has got to be the National Guard, DPS, brush units, uh, you know, state troopers, whoever it is. You know, the Texas Rangers, game wardens. That's pretty much my Neighborhood Watch. And if they're not out there, 
they're coming to yours. So um, I want to go to Representative Longoria and just talk about, you know, we're hearing about the issues that there are. I've been to Eagle Pass. I've been to Terrell County. Um, there are a lot of people, you know, coming through. You know, I was in Eagle Pass, and I was just hanging out in the golf course, and I seen people crossing over say, hey, can we, where can we turn ourselves into Border Patrol? I was like, right there, like <laughs> under the bridge over there. Um, you were talking about how in your area, um, and I think the mayor was talking about, it's much calmer. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's it's calmer, but, it, I mean, you guys have gotten used to it. And can Until manage, December right? guys, the 21st. <laughs> so if you, if well, you want to weigh so, on, and, and, and what can the federal government do to, like, get it to that level in other places? You know, so... I remember going through these discussions years ago, right, with Colonel McCraw and, and what are the metrics. And I, I always remember that one comment that was always made was, we, you'll know we're successful when they move west because we've done our part to make sure. Because that corridor in South Texas was phenomenal for folks wanting to traffic narcotics or move uh, aliens, right? Because you just go ahead and you jump across and you get on the road and you're on a major interstate pretty quick, right? That is, if you're in the business of doing illegal activity, that is the route you want to take. You don't want to go through uh, Terrell County, through the judges area. That's treacherous terrain. That's hard business for them. But why are they doing that? Because I believe that the operations have been working in South Texas. So what happened? You force these industries to go west, right? And that's why we deal more with the humanitarian aspect because those individuals that are probably crossing our area, they're probably going to get caught. And they probably know this. So they're not really trying to cross to, you know, move narcotics or, you know, I'm sure there's some coyotes there that are taking advantage of people, but they know in all likelihood they're probably going to get caught. They're trying to get caught and if, seek asylum or if, something. If like folks that. are in the business of doing illegal activity and moving fentanyl or whatever other narcotics, they're going to go through Terrell County because they have a better chance of getting away there and having to risk, you know, crossing the South Texas border, which is, you know, Hidalgo, Willacy, Star County. So I think that shows that the operations have worked, but now we have to deal with the variable that now they've gone west and now we're in the judges county and, and how do we address that? And, yeah. you know, it's unfortunate. I mean, it's, it's big county, small sheriff's department. Where do you house all these individuals? And then the other one is this. You make the arrest, right? And let's just say the federal government doesn't want to prosecute. How, how do you charge these individuals with a state crime? Where do they fit into the whole you know, system? You know, we have a border prosecution unit, which I actually helped codify back in 2015 or 17. Um, you have prosecutors that have state authority, and how do you, how does all this work in the system, right? And I think that's the complex issue that we deal with, right? Because, you know, you, you arrest these individuals, and are they committing a federal crime? Are they committing trespass? You know, where do they fit in the whole gamut of the judicial system? And then that's another problem you have to deal with, because now you're passing that over to your county attorney, your district attorney. And, I mean, if the first person's undocumented, they're probably not going to get bonded out, right? Because they'll probably be an immigration hold. Now they have to go through the whole judicial process, and you have to keep them in your jail, and then you're going to have to appoint a public defender, right, if they can't afford I mean, these are all issues down the pipeline that I think folks forget about. Yeah, and I think that's um, that's a great point because – your, your 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 thought is that it has worked because we push it out west. Now Judge Carruthers is having to deal with it. Now uh, <laughs> Representative Morales is having to deal with it. I, I wanted but, to add something. To that. Yeah, yeah, you got you got you got to talk to him after the panel. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I think it just illustrates the the point that like if we're gonna tackle it with like state resources, like we are limited as to what you can to talking about the prosecution and like what what can we do? I mean, these are federal statutes sometimes, and it's full circle because then we get back to Representative Morales' point about if we don't tackle this at a federal level, like the root cause of the immigration, we're gonna be doing this dance and y'all are gonna be spending $4 billion over and over and over again. Um, I wanna move on to a different subject because um, we're, we're running down on time and we will um, take questions when we get to 15 minutes, I'll, I'll let y'all know. Um, but I want to talk about the migrant busing program. Um, and uh, it's another one of these situations where we go full circle, where like in McAllen, uh, you know, the governor was saying, don't transport these migrants. If, 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 you, uh, if there's a bus that has migrants, DPS troopers have the authority to stop them. That was 2021. 2022 comes around. Now Eddie Morales is having to deal with the migrant buses that are state sanctioned, state authorized, going to DC, going to New York, going to Chicago, going to Philadelphia. So what are y'all's thoughts? And we'll start with Representative Morales, um, you know, about this migrant busing program. It's it's such a nuanced one because in in certain respects, it's what immigration advocates have been asking for, like get these people to their final location. Mm -hmm. But it's just the way that it's rolled out, it's been so confusing. So I wonder where you stand on it or where are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's um, another one with mixed feelings because I, I think there is a, a part that um, 
it's theatrics at the state and, and national level. And I don't think that we should use humans for that. But at the same time, I understand a number of communities deeper in the United States feel that this is a non-issue or that the immigration is, is a non-issue. Um, and it's just, you know, more drumbeat to scare Texans, but it is real. And so I like that aspect of it where they get to see and they actually get to see, well, this is what we're dealing with. And this is what the judge and the sheriff in Maverick County, where I'm from, and all the, the 11 counties that I represent. And they get to deal with it daily. And I get the photos. I get the mass lines of individuals crossing through ranches. And, uh, you know, individuals, the trash that is left behind. And all the issues that, that, that we have to deal with. So, you know, it's a, it's a mixed bag of emotions. But... Again, it goes back to that only, again, addresses just some of the issues, but doesn't go to the core issue of either the state or the federal government. And I don't have a problem. Let's, let's like you said, Texas, you know, we don't back down from the federal government that much. Um, we constantly, you know, are in litigation with them. And I think this is, if we're going to be in litigation, let's be in litigation about this that is so important to all Texans. And if we started focusing, you know, one of the major platforms when my letter to the governor was focus on the border infrastructure. The border has been the last, uh, some of the last communities that the state of Texas and our legislators have focused on. If we focused on that, not only would the border continue to grow and expand exponentially through our economic uh, progress, but also the inner cities within Texas would all benefit. If you could get cross 18-wheeler uh, uh, tr traffic, you know, uh, rather than two hours waiting on the bridge or four hours waiting on the bridge at some of these locations. And if you could get them in and out, I mean, it would be a game changer for not only the border communities and places like Laredo, for example, they're already so saturated and so much more economic um, growth coming through that now Eagle Pass and places like Del Rio and even the city of Presidio further on west, um, which is in my, our district, um, are all standing to benefit from it. You know, I represent the largest district in the state of Texas. There's over 750 miles of border. I represent nine out of the 14 counties that share a border with Mexico. I didn't want to be the border guy, but I think, you know, I just basically embraced it after my first session and said, if there's going to be somebody, might as well be me. I lived on the border. I've worked. Um, I have family both on the Eagle Pass and, and the Mexico uh, side. And I really do think that we need to think outside the box when it comes to these issues and make sure that we have, we're using the taxpayers' monies wisely and we're fixing the issue and stop making this an R, a D, or an independent thing. Uh, you raised the point of like it, it, the, the migrant busing program shows other parts of the country what y'all are dealing with um, um, on the border. Uh, Mayor Villalobos, I think I, I saw you quoted in one of the stories saying like if we can deal with it, they can deal with it too. So I wonder what your thoughts are um, as you see the migrant bus busing program happening um, and, and you know now major cities having that experience like Representative Morales is no, talking about. No, definitely. As a matter of fact, when it was going to happen, actually the governor ruined my vacation. I was in Argentina when this happened. So needless to say, the, the two issues were busing and the stopping of the 18-wheelers for inspection. Uh, I called the governor, and he actually he called back immediately within five minutes, which was pretty cool. And the issue of, of the busing was taken care of pretty quick. I said, Mayor, this is people that are that volunteer to go. I'm like, okay, if they volunteer to go. That's, that's his own fault, I would say. He did not announce it like that. So Yes, yeah. correct. Uh, so if they volunteer to go to the general area that they want to be, good. I don't like the fact that they're paying for it, especially knowing, like uh, a representative said, they have $5,000 in their pocket. I mean, why should the state of Texas pay? But you know what? It is kind of a political type of deal and to send them to wherever they're going. So, okay, that's fine. The issue, though, was the other one, the inspection of the 18-wheelers. Within a week, it was chaos. And I know that backfired. I know that one was difficult. I know there was meetings and deals with governors uh, in Coahuila, Nuevo León, Tamaulipas. And uh, to me, those were jam deals. They were just done for the purposes of late. Let's move on and, and stay away from this. In the meantime, uh, produce is rotting on oh the 18 God. wheelers, it, it was, uh, you know, messing well, up the supply chain even it more. It was one of the worst moves we could have ever yeah. done. 
oil and gas, for example, barite. I was getting calls from producers that are crossing barite for West Texas, and they're used to getting six to eight truckloads a day, and they were down to one or two truckloads. And it was only mechanical, Mayor. You're right. Yeah, it was only it mechanical. Was, it wasn't even really to address, open up the 18-wheeler back doors to see if there was any migrants. These inspections were mechanical in nature, not really doing anything to address the issue. So again, I've worked well with the governor's office, and I'm one of those Democrats that has pushed the issue of we need to reach across the aisle and work with Republicans to get anything done in independence. I'm 100% I'm, I'm behind that. But at the same time, sometimes there's certain actions that are taken more for theatrics, and it takes away from the substantive issues that we need to discuss as grown men and women in the legislature and try to fix this for all Texans. And that was one of the very few that I disagree with the governor. So, and then you get into the issue of, of New York and what was it, Boston. I mean, they were, they were drowning in a cup of water. I mean, they had a 30 people on a bus. We used to, be, we used to get 1,500 a day, 1,500 a day for months. We opened up a, a shelter. We did what we had to do. We took care of it. We never, not a single incident, uh, a criminal incident, not a single one. With 1,500 people a day for months, and probably over a year, till finally it, it, it reduced when, I don't want to say it again, but they started shifting to the West. And so even now... Uh, even Judge Carrillo is going to have a word with all of you guys <laughs> after the panel. Wait, but James, even I, now we only get about, we still probably get about 300, but it's asylum seekers. We deal with the asylum seekers. They come to downtown McAllen. Their Catholic charities processes them. They fix up the... Uh, they help them get their travel arrangements. They themselves pay, the immigrants. And they're out hopefully by the next day. As a matter of fact, I tell people uh, and whenever they go visit McAllen, because they expect to see immigrants running all over the place. They expect to see bandidos running around. <laughs> but I, I tell them, I challenge you to go find me an immigrant. You're not. You're not going to find one. I mean, it's, well, it's the situation is different for Whoa. Eagle Pass and for uh, Sanders. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yes, yeah, so. yeah. I, I, I would like to add, James, there's something very important as far as the shifting. I think something that the audience, again, um, taking into account border background and historical background. The state of Coahuila sits right across Eagle Pass, Del Rio, and much of uh, Terrell County, I believe. It's one of the safest, if not the safest, state in Mexico. And so that's why you're seeing also some of the a lot of these migrants now going through there because they're not as they're not going to be exposed to the human smugglers and the, the cartel and all that the human smuggling aspect of it. They feel that it is safer to go through there, but in the process and having a very safe state right across Eagle Pass, Del Rio, and Sanderson, we're faced with this issue because you hear it. Uh, constantly, and 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 we still have some of those more uh, battles, narco battles going taking yeah. place and I think further down. To, south. to play devil's advocate on 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 the governors, because there was some criticism of the governors' uh, deals with the with the bordering states in Mexico. It is a question of like, why don't the feds have these like you know agreements with the states, and why don't why why isn't like uh, Biden or Kamala Harris having those conversations with those states in Mexico that could help with the border enforcement so that the flow stops up on your borders. Um, where this, this will be my last question, and we'll start lining up for questions, I think. Um, but um, I do want to talk about, we can't talk about Operation Lone Star without talking about the National Guard. Um, you know, the governor has boasted that there were 10,000 service members deployed down there. Um, it's, it's not been a fun ride for them. Uh, pay issues, uh, very, very poor living conditions. Um, now there's a tax issue that their tax, tax forms are incorrectly withheld. Um, and there's been suicides tied to the mission, right? Um, and let's be, let's be honest, a lot of them don't want to be out there. I mean, the, the National Guard is supposed to be for short-term stints. Hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, you know, most recently like COVID vaccine stuff, you know, where you need emergency in and out. Um, these guys and gals did not sign up to be out there on year long deployments on the National Guard. So, Representative Longoria, I mean, where are you on that? I and mean, what have you heard? I mean, uh, does it does it look like we're going to keep five thousand people? That that's part of the that's part of the cost too. So, you know, we saw this issue early on 
back in 17 and in 19 when there was a big influx of DPS troopers down in South Texas. Many of these troopers, the men and women that worked for the department, did not live in South Texas nor have connections to South Texas. They lived all across the state. So not only were you taking those individuals from their respective areas because they were out there patrolling their communities, now you're taking them away from their families, right? So being away from your family to perform your job, I mean, it, it does become difficult. Now, I commend all the men and women in the Guard, but I, I do think to a certain point, a lot of them probably did not sign up for that, thinking that that was something they were going to do. So the situation is where they're, where they're going and, and deploying them to South Texas. So as a state, you know, we need to provide them the resources. One, we need to make sure they're getting paid. You know, we need to make sure that uh, they're rotating them in a way that allows them to go back to their families. But it, you look at the mental health, right? You make sure that they're you know, in a situation, in a mindset to be able to protect Texas. And to a certain extent, that's what they're doing. But I think that's the unfortunate part. Whenever you're dealing with situations like that on a federal issue, I mean, there is Border Patrol agents down there, right? And, and this is just an aid to the Border Patrol agent. And then you get to the next question. Okay, well, what is the guard going to do? You know, you know, DPS, law enforcement, guard, where do they fit in that nexus? And then how does it work, right? A guardsman, man or woman, sees someone, you know, crossing the border. Do they notify the department? Do they go through Border Patrol? And we're basically giving the federal government all the resources or extra resources to do a job that they're obligated to do. So it's, it's a tough situation. In a perfect world, we wouldn't be doing that, right? And we would use our guard whenever we have natural disasters or situations like that. But, you know, we're, we're dealing with this. So how things change, you know, hopefully we can scale back on the presence of the guard down there uh, because it's unfortunate what's happening. And these men and women are plucked out of their communities and we need them when there's a natural disaster. We don't need them sitting in the brush, flagging down two undocumented folks and then notifying DPS or, and then they'll notify Border Patrol to come in and make some arrests and then ultimately find out it was just, you know, two asylum seekers and then they'll send them off to the respite center and then they'll be sitting there getting processed and the next thing you know, they're getting bused to another community. I mean. And, and, and the, the legislature, I mean, you were talking about the sacrifice that these folks make to, to be out there. The legislature did cut the student tuition assistance program for National Guardsmen. That's something that uh, Major General Seltzer has advocated and has asked for. He wants that funding back and to increase that funding. Um, and there's also proposals from some of your colleagues um, to uh, provide death benefits for people who unfortunately die, like uh, Specialist Bishop Evans, who died trying to rescue uh, migrants in the river. Um, I'll ask you, Representative Longoria and Representative Morales, I mean, are those things that you could support? Of, of course. Look, both my daughters are Girl Scouts. They donated cookies to these guardsmen. And to see their faces of these men and women, I mean, they're performing hard work. They're out in the South Texas heat, right, working and doing their part on what they can do for this entire situation. And whatever we can do to help out those men and women, I mean, they're good Texans. The fact that they signed up for, you know, working as guardsmen, I mean, that tells you a lot about their character. So anything we can do as a state to help these men and women, I think we should all be for it. Just the way we double down on border security, we need to double down on the men and women that are actually doing the work. And Representative Morales, same agree. question. One hundred percent agree. You know, we went out, our families and our friends, and we were able to. I think it was July the fourth uh, when we took hot dog, hot dogs, and 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 burgers, and we actually cooked them there in the in the tent. They allowed us to see these 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 young men and women and the work that they're doing, but also to see how. They're away from their families and the long extended periods of time. And then you constantly hear in our newspaper either somebody, you know, uh, uh, either drowning or physically, you know, uh, you, you know, uh, getting hurt or committing suicide. You know, it's hard. It's hard for, for them. And I think we definitely need to do more for them and their families. And, and I 100 percent would support those measures. Okay. Uh, I think we're about ready to start taking questions. I'll ask one more question to Representative Morales and Longoria. Um, we've talked a lot about the mission. Um, it does seem like there's conversation about it. You know, it has worked for you guys, um, and there are benefits from it. Um, $3 billion, though, was the, uh, I think, appropriations bill. Now we're at $4 billion with some of these transfers that, it has to be said, have, have taken from other agencies that need that, like the Criminal Justice Agency, uh, the Juvenile Justice uh, Department. Um, and so if... Uh, leadership presents to you guys another three billion dollar um, bill for what Operation Lone Star is going to look like. Is that something you can support, or are you going to have to have conversations about that? Well, I think conversations on how it's being spent. But you know, being from South Texas, and we, me and the mayor and, and, and Mr. Morales and, and the judge, 
But us directly down in the Rio Grande Valley, we've been direct beneficiaries over the last decade of all this border funding, right? Hotel occupancy taxes are up. Our you know, restaurants are full. And there's constantly a law enforcement presence, which actually I think helps keep the community safe, right? Indirectly. Um, the flip side is I, that that money is going well, towards, towards well, you guys. Well, where well, it could so, be going so to the rest of the state. Right, yeah. If the state of Texas wants to spend $4 billion to protect the border and a majority of that money is going to my backyard, how can I be against it, right? And that's a decision for everyone else that lives outside of South Texas in the Rio Grande Valley to make. And that's the discussion that can be had with their elected officials on whether that's an initiative. But by all means, if we're going to send Texan dollars to the border to protect the border and in a sense protect my backyard, I'm all for it. Uh, Representative Morales, three three billion dollar bill coming at you, coming your way. You in or out? I'm in. I agree with Representative Longoria's comments, but I think we need to also add the measures that we discussed, substantive ways that we can try to fix the core issue. And I think we can get there if we all set our differences aside, focus on the things that can bind us together, focus on those things, and pass effective immigration reform policies at the state level, and then just see what the Department of Justice does. Uh, and we can do it through workforce agreements, I think, and we can do it through a number of like that EIM pilot project. And then also make sure, you know, you have the added issue, like the, the judge hasn't had an opportunity to tell you how, but we constantly are communicating how these 49 or 50 folks pass, and then you have to have troopers shifted over to that area. But we, they don't have hotels, they don't have Airbnbs, and so now they're having to spend an hour getting to Sanderson and an hour back, and that's just costing, again, taxpayer monies because they could be actually patrolling on Sanderson. And again, those are ways that I think we can fix the issue if there's gonna be an additional allotment of money that we can retrofit some buildings that the judge and I have addressed to make sure that we have the law enforcement there where it's needed most, not having to travel one hour one way and one hour back at or the end of the shift. three hours, so Dessa. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Ken Paxton doesn't seem like a guy who's afraid of the federal government, so um, I think we've got a question over here. Yeah, hi. According to econom uh, economist Ray Perryman of the Perryman Group, Texas lost an estimated $477 million in produce, labor, and fuel due to Governor Abbott's enhanced checks of commercial trucks for border security in April of this year. This resulted in an estimated $9 billion loss in GDP between April 6th through the 15th, only to turn up nothing out of these extensive searches of commercial trucks. Now, I understand that border security is a federal issue, relatively speaking, but do you have any thoughts on the ways that Texas can prevent catastrophic spending that yields no results for knee-jerk reactions like Governor Abbott and these border security checks? Is there anyone in particular you want to answer that? I'll let the Republicans take that first. <laughs> yeah. No, but that's very simple. I think we all, uh, we all agreed that we disagreed with that action. I mean, there's no question about it. I think we all disagree with that action. I think it was, in, in a sense, a political, a political move that backfired. So, I mean, that's, that's basically it. We, I, all of us disagree with it. But is there something that you think we can do to prevent that happening in the future? Well, there you go. I kick it to the reps. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, the, the new legislation, the, the bill draft, make sure that we incorporate certain substantive measures there that would address it and maybe also certain prohibitions, you know, from the governor t uh, taking. I don't know how that's going to go. I'm just thinking out loud here, guys. So, <laughs> Representative Longoria? <laughs> we had a question over here? Yes. Uh, I'm Mark Terry. I'm with the uh, Elementary Principals Association. I've had an opportunity to visit some of the schools in your communities. Uh, a couple of questions. The impact on services in the school and impact on the services for students in the communities, have those been impacted uh, by this situation? Can you ask that question again, just maybe more succinctly? Yeah. Uh, when I talk to principals, they talk about services for students mainly being impacted by the community, the services going other places maybe. Can you talk about how the state can help uh, impact services for students in those communities? Regarding the immigration issues? Or yes. Okay. Well, uh, even though we're not in the school or anything, but for us it's very easy uh, you have a lot of kids that come in with, with their parents, mm -hmm. but as far as our area, they don't stick around. Okay. It's 
they just flow through. So we really haven't had an impact or or anything. They go the next day, they're pretty much out. So I don't know about the different areas, but as far as the border, usually that's not the area they want to stay in. They usually want to go to, I guess it'd be a question more appropriate for Houston, San Antonio, Dallas, or even further in. Gotcha. But for our area, at least McAllen, the Rio Grande Valley, I don't think we've been impacted at all. Okay, thank you. Judge yes, I, I kind of want to touch on that just a bit. So you, we did mention Uvalde in the last uh, thing and, and possibly securing the schools and uh, making sure that the schools have bullet resistant uh, buildings or, or whatever the safety measures may be. In my situation, which I, I would love to have a, some type of a funding consideration for the the school systems that that can't afford to get their schools all bullet resistant and whatnot. I have a lot of high pursuits that that end up on uh, on foot, and I literally had to lock down my school not too long ago. And the little community having uh, that particular group running through the co uh, community, and me having to make a phone call to my superintendent to lock it down. If the funding it becomes available to to enhance the schools, it's it's a two win. It's a two-part win because, yes, we are affected by whatever's coming across border situation-wise, but also in secure our schools in a fashion where, um, you know, we're a little bit more safeguarded. So we could win in that aspect. Question over here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jennifer Alani Zogby. I live here in Austin. I'm an advocate. Um, I grew up in the Valley and Laredo. Um, my family's in Benitas, La Jolla, and despite what my husband says, they're two very different places, even though they're three miles away. And my lineage also goes back to the 1520s here in Texas. So again, long history, but the Valley has changed and the border has changed so much over the last few years. And my concern really is just for safety. My grandfather's land, his ranch, is also on the river. My mom's house, the border wall is from here to the other side of the stadium. You can literally go walk and touch it. And safety isn't what it used to be. Even taking my kids to visit in the summer, you, the, and actually the safety issues stem more, I'm more concerned about law enforcement, sadly enough, than I am from the immigrants that come across. Like there's drones overhead, so you have no privacy. My kids can't walk from my mom's house to my grandfather's house in the pajamas without being, you know, without surveillance. Um, there's, there was one time when we were down there and Border Patrol decided to storm into the property because they felt there was somebody in the back without a warrant, without permission. My kids could have been playing outside and they would have been hurt. Well, my grandfather- We're, we're, we're running a little short on time. I think oh, there's sure. someone behind you, so if you could ask the okay, question. Okay, well, real quick. So, so I guess my big thing is safety. And to, to, to be quick, my grandfather, to stop, to, because they didn't have permission, couldn't do anything. So what he did was um, he closed the gate. He closed the gate so the Border Patrol couldn't leave. So they had to ask him permission to leave, you know, because yeah. what power does a 94-year-old man have? But again, there is these safety issues. So what can you, what can any of you do to ensure the safety of the people who actually live along there and have been there for generations? Well, I actually represent, I went to school in La Jolla, and I actually oh. represent La Jolla and Peñitas. And my district office, one of my offices is in Peñitas, and you can literally see the border from the office. Um, my, my family's at Ramirez's. We live right yes, by the church. Yes, okay, so I, I know them. <laughs> well, look, this is a situation that always occurs because we've doubled down on law enforcement. So you have an influx of DPS. There is a lot of Border Patrol agents. And now with technology, you're seeing more of the blimps. You see all those aerostats. And unfortunately, if you're really close proximity to the border, it's an issue that unfortunately you have to deal with I've seen now it's unfortunate because I have constituents call me all the time like they'll show up from work and there'll be a drove of individuals that have been detained and they're in their front yard and you know we deal with issues where they cut fences uh, it, it it's where law enforcement needs to have a balance and they need to understand that those areas are heavily populated by folks that live there and for safety concerns Try, if you're going to go ahead and funnel individuals, funnel them to an area that's a little bit more safe. Many times they don't have that opportunity, but if they can, we just need to make sure as legislators, as elected officials, to tell them like, hey, if you can go further west to the more desolate areas, do that. Because sometimes they'll funnel them in and they just want to get on a roadway really quick, which is a quick city street to just jump on. 
and that causes all that. But you're seeing more of it because of the extra presence, right? It always existed, but it would kind of just pass through because they don't want to stay there. They just want to continue to cross. But now because we have the cameras and we have you know, the drones, we're seeing them and they're intercepting them. And that's what's causing those issues. And, and I've seen houses ransacked where individuals haven't you know, eaten for, for days because they've trekked that long course and, and water. And, and it's just, it's unfortunate, but that's, that's the bad side of being so close proximity to the South Texas border. Right. So there's a bad side. So any plans or any ideas as to what could help the, re the residents that live there from dealing with what they have to well, deal I with? Well, I, I think DPS has done a good job to try to move some of that stuff to more rural areas. It's Border Patrol. I mean, what is Border Patrol doing? You know, how are they running their routes? How are they setting up, you know, their horses? How are they running their boats? Because you can put a presence in those areas that are close proximity to a neighborhood and funnel those individuals kind of a certain area where we can't cross here, but we can cross over there. Well, you know, that that's what they need to do. And, and really, it goes back to the federal government. I mean, that's something where they have to make those decisions on how they're going to execute their plan and how they're going to protect the border. And bring, I, bring it up with the feds, hot potato. Th thank you for your question. Right, thank you. Uh, the next, next word, I think we have under three minutes, so if it, it could be brief. Got it. Uh, my name is Taylor Trevino. I'm an organizer here in Austin and Latino communities. I've got lots of family in the Valley. Um, so this is a follow-up, I think it was uh, Representative Morales. Were you implying that we should create a two to thousand, two to five thousand dollar uh, application fee for asylum seekers. Um, I, you know, I would that create an unjust barrier to people seeking asylum? And do we want to be a state that is prof profiting off of people fleeing violence? Profiting off of people that are what? Fleeing violence. Fleeing violence. Yeah, if we're going to create this type of barrier, I understand we want to, you know, benefit economically where we can, and obviously diminish human trafficking and things like that, but charging people $5,000? I mean, I don't know. Can you clarify, please? Yeah, well, I mean, they're going to pay it one way or the other, right? They're going to pay it to the human smugglers or the cartel, or they can do it through land ports where it's much safer for them as well as our law enforcement, and we're actually providing a service to or them. Or can they come and turn themselves in for free as what I thought was typically the process with asylum seeking? You know, I'm not an expert, but I, sorry. Yeah, I think... I, I think I think we need to, you know, the expenses that are associated with this and the losses that we have, um, just on HB9 alone, $1.8 billion additional monies. I think we need to be good stewards as legislators, and I think that the taxpayers of Texas would expect us to think outside the box and make sure that there's ways that we can recoup this money that's not coming out of the backs of Texans. And I think this is, they're coming, they're wanting a better life, they're already in their head, they've already, you know, assured themselves there's an expense associated with that, and there's a benefit that they get. Every one of them, I think, would happily pay those $2,000 if they knew that they could get that, uh, you know, Texas EIN pilot project purple card and, you know, be here in the state of Texas and, and have some sort of pathway to residency, for example, after five or seven years. I'm also adding that there should be an annual renewal fee so that we can keep check on them, and as well as they understand, there's gotta be money, there's gotta be a buy-in, there's gotta be, when, when it costs someone something, I think the chances are much more that they're vested, because it's not just being given free to them, they're actually having to put something now to it. I feel Representative like Raz, we, we've actually run out of time, like you, you actually weirdly hit it right on the zero, on the countdown here. So we've run out of time, but thank you so much to the panelists and thank you for your questions. Um, and thank you so much.